Welcome to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. We interview great guests who inspire you to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Be sure you visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, just relax as you listen. You can do something else, but be ready to make an important note. And let's get started. The title of this interview is Mental Health and Peak Performance. My guest is Mandy Fridger, and that is spelled F-R-E-G-E-R. Correct, Mandy? Correct. Okay, yeah. very good. So we're off to a good start. <laughs> we'll talk about autism, PTSD, anxiety using applied behavioral analysis, and energy psychology, as well as peak performance. So it's not just the mental health part, peak performance as well, using those modalities, correct? Yep. Fantastic. Talk about diversity. Um, also, her new book for autism, Caring, Caregiving, is coming out. We'll talk about that as well. Mandy, Mandy is a counselor. Uh, you know, she's she's not just a personal developer. She's a, a counselor, a therapist, and wait till you hear this resume and uh, biography, man. I'm we're keeping it short, but uh, we we're, we're, we're get the real deal over here. So uh, her counseling approach is truly individualized, typically blending energy therapeutic techniques and principles of applied behavioral analysis, analysis ABA, to treat a rainbow of issues, including but not limited to autism spectrum spectrum disorders, ASD, through the lifespan, peak performance, general fatigue, anxiety, depression, trauma, cognitive disorders, and managing pain. That's just, we really, there's a lot of things you work with. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's just the intro. Now, let me tell you about Mandy and her, you know, that resume that I really got all excited about. Okay. So throughout her career, Mandy has served in multiple roles within many service lines of behavioral health treatment, including acting as a supervisor in both outpatient and, resi and residential settings in providing decades, doesn't look decades, but it, by the way, Mandy, 99% of the audience listens to the podcast on one of the podcast platforms, you know, very few people look on YouTube, but if you're one of those people, I recommend going over to YouTube and checking it out. I I'm rather ugly. But Mandy is very easy on the eyes. I, I, I say that very professionally and respectfully, very easy on the eyes. Uh, she's had an extensive experience uh, with those with aut autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, and that is called ASD. When I first was reading ASD, I was like, what is ASD? And I'm, we're going to get into that because I have a lot to learn about that. And I, and I know that's not an uncommon thing. Mandy was one of the initial candidates to obtain the behavior specialist license, as well as status as a certified trainer in functional behavioral assessment in Pennsylvania with emphasis on autism spectrum disorder treatment planning. She is also a licensed professional counselor in Pennsylvania. You know, I see when I, when I announce someone's bio, obviously I respect it very much, but I like to interject sometimes when there's, I think something appropriate for my own my own side and I'll, and here it is <laughs> so uh and you're gonna get to talk man here right? it's not gonna be all tony uh you know filibustering is that i psychology is my favorite subject i think you might like it you might like it a bit too uh and uh since i first began studying it in the early 90s and since then periodically i would always consider going to school for you know becoming a counselor or therapist lcsw because it's so one such a wonderful subject you know why do we do what we do or why do we not do what we don't do uh and um but about five years ago i decided to make a decision because this was like almost like an it, not an obsessive thought but it would come back intermittently and i'm like ah, should i go back should i go to school and i decided as an entrepreneur which, you know, I, I was a life coach now i'm a, the head of a technological coaching company that i could reach a lot more people uh, and and have a greater impact uh, as an entrepreneur. Now, and I'm not I'm not poo pooing the field of psychology at all. I'm a big fan, <laughs> but uh, and I'm doing that with because I I'm working on my 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 virtual coaching program 
Proficio, which was is close to launch finally, which is going to revolutionize self-help and personal development. So the point I'm, I'm alluding to is you got to make a decision. Decision, make a decision and something follows. Without a decision, it's a lot of, you know, wavering. All right. I hope that wasn't too unforgivable. <laughs> uh, you, but guys, you got to go to the YouTube. You got to check out Mandy. She's, again, respectfully, very attractive person. She's smiling and she's like, my, it's like shine and shine is like am i gonna do i have white spots on my face mandy was the first director of autism services within an affiliation agreement with cleveland clinic children's hospital to bring its model of autism services to southwestern pennsylvania which included overseeing a licensed private school and a diagnostic center originally trained in energy psychology techniques emdr that's through using the eyes right mandy yep mm -hmm. And TFT, was that EFT? Thoughtful therapy was actually the first meridian-based therapy. EFT the was sort of the, the child of thought-filled therapy. So we don't hear a lot about yeah, oh, it, yeah, this was that was the prototype or, or the precedent. So EMDR is, is, is a method where a, uh, a practitioner works with the client to deal with issues using eye movements or uh, using the eyes to say that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and TFT is, uh, as you said, mer using meridians, which is like sort of like a combination of hypnosis and agu acupressure to give it a rough description that may be. Well, EMDR is not actually hypnosis. So, so that's a separate um, intervention. And the EMDR folks will be real clear about that. Because no, not EMDR, hypnosis. TFT. I yeah. mean. CFT isn't hypnosis either. So, so need, the difference is, is hypnosis would be altering a state of consciousness as you are, per se. And you don't do that with TFT? No. Okay, all right. All right, thank you for that clarity. Otherwise, I would have left here dumb. Uh, and what? And, and it's also, uh, there's also, the TFT test is DXTM. So that's a trademark of DX. Is that what that is? Yes, that was um, one of Dr. Callahan was actually originated thought field therapy, and then he had students under underneath him, the first generation of these practitioners who were fairly well known, and that was one of his students' um, trademark diagnostic ways of using thought field therapy. So it's very technical. I don't probably don't uh, well, need to oh, get into no, the differences here, but it was good. No, it's good to illuminate. I obviously I illuminate this stuff and to you know give information on it for myself. If I think it's interesting. I hopefully other people think it's interesting. I think it's interesting as heck. Right. So she used those those modalities to treat trauma, mood, and pain disorders and learning challenges. Mandy has been using a variety of energy-based modalities with children, adolescents, adult, adults, and staff. Mandy is a former board member and education chair for the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology and holds diplomat status in comprehensive energy psychology. So we're dealing with, you know. She's been, she's done, she's got some work. She went to school, unlike me. She, she, she didn't like just fake it. She, she's been to school. Mandy works with athletes to advocate for effective mental health practices, utilizing energy psychology tools to address trauma, injury management, and clinical barriers to peak performance. In her free time, Mandy is passionate about fitness and is a group fitness indoor cycling. We were saying before the interview, uh, I first, I, I know Mandy through Facebook and I added her because I always add psychologists and people and, and personal developers. And, and so she's one of those. So I added that. And then I would, then on Facebook on the live in the morning, I would see her live. She'd pop up on her stationary cycle. And as I said, very respectfully, she's an attractive woman. I'm like, okay, what's, who's, what's this woman talking about? She would talk very casually to the camera as she, um, you know, not quickly, not briskly uh, pedaled and just have a nice conversation, a nice morning little talk. And it was very intriguing. So that was well done, well done. Uh, so, and she's an instructor at that. Uh, and uh, she holds a basic certificate in integrative and functional mes medicine to IFM. What is IFM? Integrative and functional medicine. It's, oh. it's, a, board. it's a board and they, they've just, they're really a specialization for physicians, but they've just opened up their trainings for um, licensed mental health professionals. So I went through the basic training because so many things in a person's physical health or related to their mental health, of course. So I wanted a little bit of background with that. That's, that's fantastic. Well, that's, that's a, you do a lot. That's, you know, and 
that's a great resume. That's a great uh, scheme of abilities. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, I, so obviously you're a therapist, obviously. Yes. Uh, do you consider yourself something else besides that? Like a coach or something else? Well, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. David Gruder, <laughs> probably quote him a few times today. Um, he refers to the way that I practice and the way that he practices and others in his circle as therapist coaches. So what kind of thera therapist, a little bit of coaching? I mean, the line in general has gotten very blurred, I think, through the years with the difference for counselors and coaches. Like I remember when I was in graduate school, the idea for counseling was not to necessarily give people advice or tell them what to do and have them come through their own process. Although recently I've come to find that that's a lot of what coaching philosophy is also teaching now too. And then there are times, and I can get into this with autism spectrum disorder, that there is a need, and especially with younger kids, for a little bit higher direction. And it's not you need to do this, or I think this is, would be a good decision for you, but, but some people are in need of some direction. And I like how you said earlier, like I just had to make a choice. And this also falls into my philosophy of, of the way I work, combining the ABA in the energy psychology is that when it comes down to it, we're dealing in, in the therapeutic realm with thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And ultimately there has to be some action somewhere if, if a person wants to get better or move forward. So I'm, I'm definitely a therapist who is goal-directed and we want action. Um, and I know sometimes it's easy, you know, even for my colleagues, I know we have a hard job sometimes and sometimes people feel a lot of compassion fatigue and are, are a little bit exhausted of their job. And it's easy to just listen to people and just take it in a lot. And sometimes that's very therapeutic for the person, but sometimes we need to sort of shift directions. And that's the art I think that I bring to the table with counseling is to know my client, know what they need at what time. Is this the time to listen? Is this the time to do a little bit of relaxation treatment? Is this the time to, you know, suggest some action, um, you know, or to talk about thoughts? And of course, they drive that process too. So I have a very client-centered, driven process. Although I have modalities, one size doesn't fit all. And that sometimes is difficult to not fall into as a therapist because we get excited about our new tool and we want to just use that tool with everybody. And sometimes right. that's not what everybody needs. And as you mentioned, I, I work with a wide variety of individuals. My original experience was with, with clinical disorders, PTSD, anxiety, depression, pain management under my first mentor who developed the test, the X, that's Dr. Greg Nicosia. And so it was very clinical driven with the energy techniques. And then I moved away from that and I got into autism spectrum disorder, not to, not because I wanted to, it was sort of a forced choice, but it was what I was meant to do. And and I've worked a lot with that. And then the peak performance end is um, very, it's an area of need right now, I think. And I've, I've learned this from my experience with autism spectrum disorder that even with some of those young people who have a lot of skills, sometimes people sort of pass them off or they, they go under the radar and say, oh, they're fine. You know, they don't need a lot of support. But when you talk to them, you know, they might be struggling internally a little bit. So it's the same with the peak performers. The athletes, we look good, we smile, we come to work every day, or we're, you know, pounding out work, or, you know, our sport or our, our music or whatever, but there might be some internal struggle or, you know, desire to be better and sort of the self sabotage, because I'm not good enough, which is the primal brain stuff kicking in, which I can talk about too, with the energy psychology. So that's, that's what I do, kind of how I do it in a nutshell, and what my philosophy is, essentially. Wow, and uh, you really bring quite a, an ability to your clients or capability. Uh, you know, I, I simplistically uh, defined or described, you know, obviously therapists and coaches are two, you know, two sides of the same coin. And I would say that therapy or therapists help clients uh, reconcile with the past. Uh, and that, that's, I might be simplistic, but just to have people who don't know any of the nuances and coaches help clients pursue goals which are in the future and and obviously you know all the real magic happens in the present <laughs> right at any moment uh but uh, but but uh, more and more 
therapists who are certified psychologists uh, have, have learned modalities of coaching, perhaps neuro-linguistic programming, which is fantastic, you know, which is very controversial, but I got to tell you in coaching, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, do you use NLP at all? I don't, it's more. I mean, I probably do inadvertently in, in parts, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's always been controversial, but more and more in the field of psychology, uh, they say, oh, they use this or they use that. And, and, and then people point out, well, NLP has been doing that for years. <laughs> yes, you know? yeah. But uh, you and more and more uh, therapists are become, calling themselves coaches, which is a not a regulated field ever since uh, someone started in the early 90s, you know, and this new dynamic field, which is growing all the time. Life coaches are probably the biggest specific title. Uh, and so more therapists are becoming also coaches. And certainly that's you, uh, whether you even call yourself with that, you, you uh, that or not, you, you really size up the client and you, and you, and you look into your own toolbox, uh, which seems to be quite diverse. And you say, okay, how, how can I work with them? And you really assess them individually. And so is, is that accurate that you, you look at, you know, what's behind them, the, the past perhaps, as well as the future or where they want to go? Yeah, I don't know that it's always about the past, though. It, it, it depends on the person. Um, some people come in with a very clear issue, you know, that they want to work on. And sometimes that is something that happened in the past, but likely it's something that's affected them in the present, if it is something in the past. So it does all kind of tie together. And what we're seeing in the world today brings a lot of people in with what we call anticipatory anxiety is like the what ifs, what's going to happen next, what, you know, what, what's coming up. So looking with concern to the future on one or more aspects of their life. So I guess it transcends if we want to think of time as linear. I don't necessarily, but <laughs> we want to, we want to say that it, it, it's very different for any individual coming in. You know, uh, speaking of anxiety, I have a new empathy for people who suffer from anxiety. I've, I, I'm an ex-paratrooper. I was a military guy, you know, uh, ex-combat soldier. And I've always been a rather brave person. I don't say that with any self-aggrandizement. Okay. I never had anxiety about anything. All right. I'm, and I'm 56. So I've been around a bit. All right. Uh, and, um, and then recently, uh, I have a new girlfriend. And she likes, she likes to spend a lot of time. We've got to spend time in relationships. Okay. I'm not, obviously, but she, she likes to spend a little bit more time with me than I like to do with her. And I love her. All right. But so, so she, so she wants to sleep over a lot. Then soon thereafter, I would wake up in the middle of the night with a, a feeling very uncomfortable with this a kind of anxiety. It was more of a feeling. It's not a thought, you know, and, I, and when I was a coach, uh, I would say, okay, I would work, you know, I could work with someone who has anxiety. Uh, and, and um, as long as they weren't, had a, didn't have a, um, di you know, a diagnosis. Um, and that's about, you know, and we use various modalities, you know, about how them, you know, things working out in the future instead of the, the thing that they dread happening. Uh, but this was not, there was hardly a thought here. This was just a feeling, okay? Mm -hmm. Just a feeling. And so uh, me with all my tools, NLP, you know, rational thinking, I was like, okay, there's a, you know, a breathe, deep breathing. I was still having a rough time with it. And, and I still have it, to, you know, I, I've dealt with it for the most part. Uh, sometimes I just have to leave the room and just get some air and then return. But, uh, you know, and it's not totally, I'm not having totally reconciled, but I, what ha here's one thing that's really great is that I have this new empathy. <laughs> and that is a wonderful thing for me to have you know for people who, ha who have anxiety okay well now it's not that you know tony is this brave guy and i you know why can't you be like me this ex-veteran you know why can't you just you know s you know suck it up no sometimes it's just too it's too much and you can't intellectualize it or even approach it so that was a great thing for me to, to do well go on yeah, thank you for sharing that story because it, it really is relevant on so many levels. Um, just recently, I, I've had a lot of people say to me that, you know, why I can't understand people who have anxiety or why it gets so bad that someone would need to come to counseling. And so I feel like I've heard a lot of very polarized views on that for a long time. And, you know, maybe, maybe how you might have thought about it before you had this experience. 
And, you know, what I say to those people is, you know, everybody's experience is different. You know, how you're raised and your environmental conditioning and training is very different too. And then you never know how a new event in your life is going to affect you. So, and, and that, you know, it could be a great thing, like, you know, like your situation, this is really a good thing. And I don't know where this is coming from, which leads to the next point about energy psychology in the body. So the body, this is how I explain this to clients. I, I say the body communicates two ways. It communicates from the top down, from the mind down to the physical body and from the physical body up to the mind and probably more than that, but that's very simplified for the sake of the discussion. And what that means is, is our thoughts can influence our physical sensations in our body. And sometimes when we have physical sensations, they start screaming at our brain, hey, warning. And then our cognitions try to make sense of it in a certain way. And so an example of this might not be so direct, like, oh my gosh, why do I have this stomachache? What's wrong? Stomachache, what's wrong? What's wrong? It might not be that straightforward. It might be stomach hurts brain has a moment of what we call reversal or a flip. And then I start worrying, oh no, what am I going to have to do tomorrow? And it seems like it's completely irrelevant. But to me, it, it's like the brain try to, it finds that thing to hinge on what resonates with that vibration that's sort of disturbed or low in, in the gut or wherever in the lower body and tries to make sense of it and align energetically. So this comes up a lot with clients. And in fact, the beauty of using some of the energy psychology tools is you don't have to identify what the reason is of why you have these feelings. So like you could come to me and say, listen, I just wake up in the middle of the night and I feel like, I don't know if it's panic. I don't know if it's anxiety. It just feels like this, you know, this weight's on my chest. And that's all I need to know really to start the energy psychology sort of uh, to use those tools. And I specifically use because energy psychology is an umbrella of tools. And I, I use EMDR. I'm trained in that. I use thought field therapy, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, was actually the first meridian therapy. And EFT was is a very, very simplified version of, of TFT. And so TFT is very diagnostic. It's, it's in my opinion, much more um, appropriate for, for clinical use. And it, because it's a little bit even faster than EFT, if, if you're really... Um, savvy to Dr. Callahan's what are called reversals and those types of things. So back in the day when we used to use these, I used to work with a lot of kids and right, kids couldn't articulate what was wrong. They would just have a stomach ache or whatever. And we could start there. So when we look at the meridians, I'm going to just take this in another direction. When we look at the meridians, the meridians all correspond to an organ system, but also an emotion. And so with the diagnostic way of using thought field therapy, you can almost work backwards and see which meridians need to be you know, tapped or perturbed or whatever word you wanna use there. And you can almost develop a recipe and that's what Dr. Callahan did. He had certain sequences for anxiety, for trauma, for a phobia, those types of things, because you could put them together with the emotion and it was like a little recipe or a sandwich. So it's a little bit shorter, more eloquent than EFT, um, but nevertheless, the EFT is, is good too. It's just a little bit of a longer way. So, so when people come in and say, you know, I'm just getting these weird feelings out of nowhere. I don't think it's connected to thought. I don't know if it's connected to a thought. A traditional therapist who uses cognitive behavioral therapy might say, well, let's talk about all of this. And you might say, I want to talk about this. So this is where me, Mandy, as a therapist, I said, do you want to figure this out? Do you want to talk about it? Or do you just want the feeling to go away right now? How do you want to, how do you want to proceed first? And, you know, someone will pick. And if they want to talk about it first, they say, oh, okay, I don't know, I don't know. And they kind of go around and start, with, okay, well, let's treat it a little bit. And then after the treatment, sometimes, you know, there's a new perspective or, oh, you know what I just remembered? I forgot to tell you this. Three days before that, X, Y, and Z happened. And I had that same feeling kind of, but I don't know why that would be relevant to this. But you know what? That person was with me when I had that experience, right? So inevitably, when we start to use some of the tapping and the energy therapy, what we think we're doing, and we don't actually know why these, these uh, mechanisms work completely yet, we're learning, but we think it deactivates the amygdala, the fight, flight, and freeze mechanism in our brain. And when we can calm that down and get it out of that danger, Will Robinson kind of zone, we can use our rational mind to think and problem solve and put pieces together, hence the action and the thought. So we get the feeling under control that's too scary or too um, out of 
out of the realm of comfort, let's put it that way, and then our thoughts and behaviors can follow. So that's a great example. I have people come in all the time that will say, you know, I've I've mastered this. I've done a lot of relaxation. I do meditation, and this came out of nowhere. And maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Wow, that was extremely illuminating. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Mandy. And you know, I also have to I'll let my girlfriend off the hook because you know I had I was kind of blaming her. Uh, air quotes uh, for um, this new feeling, this new sensation, and then I, and then subsequently, I sleeping by myself. I had the feeling again. So I was like, "Oh, I can't blame her anymore. She's not yeah. here taking up my space." You know. Well, so, and so that that's a behavior piece, though. So as in my behaviorist lens, we if you would want to explore all that, we would put all those pieces together. Okay, what are the antecedents? What was present before this? What wasn't present? And maybe she would be a piece on the table. And yeah. then maybe after you tell me that, we say, okay, well, we need to eliminate this. So there's variables, right? That thank, we you for put, thank you for putting her back in the hot seat for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Well, let me ask you straight out, Mandy. Am I crazy? Am I <laughs> okay, great stuff. Fantastic. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back with Mandy Fridger. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Proficio. When people learn something, they want to use it so it has real value. And the best teacher is experienced. Visit www.proficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O. Where Proficio will have you taking action with what you're learning immediately. You'll be closer to your goals before you even realize it. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petrozo. We're here with the delightful Mandy Fridger. We're having a wonderful, organic conversation. <laughs> uh, and it's very interesting and valuable and really teaches you a lot about her, you know, about psychology and her modalities. Uh, and I'm learning a lot. I mean, it's, this is fantastic. But, you know, I, I, I'd also like to mention, you know, um, Getting back to some of the things you were saying, uh, you mentioned sometimes the feeling in the stomach. You know, we a lot of our most significant feelings are in that gut area, right? right. They, you know, whether they be the most delightful feelings or the opposite, <laughs> right? Do you think there? Do you think there's some significance to that? Sometimes people, I've heard people call the gut the second brain, even. Yeah. You know, so I'm glad you brought that, this up. And this, these are my favorite kind of conversations, the, the organic ones. And believe it or not, for those of you who listen, we did not plan these these questions, but they're, yeah. they're, it's so beautifully flowing to the next piece um, and another energy system in the body, which are the chakras. And so for those people out there who haven't heard of those, these are energy centers in the body. And there's, I think there's 365. I could be a little bit off on that, but I, I'm trained to work with a lower seven. And those lower seven... If you've ever Googled a picture or if you've seen a picture of like a human outline and you see like these little round dots sort of up, up the midline of their body in the colors of a rainbow, yeah. that's what those are. They're depicting those energy centers. And I, I want to say first that the, everyone has these. These are not specific to ethnicity or religion. Even and me? They, yeah, they're just, everyone has them. And so their power centers really and they also they have a sound vibration that matches with them they have a color vibration but they also have an emotional component to them also and so more often than not when I say to people where do you feel this disturbance whatever it is whatever the issue is in their body many times they're going to say in my stomach in my chest in my throat in my head and that runs right along that midline of where those energy centers are so to me, as an energy therapist, I say, okay, there's probably, um, you know, an underactivated um, chakra somewhere there. There might be one that's overactivated, and I use my tools and dig in and help to get to the bottom of it. But it's really interesting about the gut. If I if I just segue to what I've learned in the integrative and functional medicine training, so much of where where holistic medicine is headed really is the connection between the brain and the gut. And there is so much communication there physiologically also that I think that eventually in the next five or 10 years, it's going to be sort of a no brainer conversation that, yeah, heck yeah, they go together. Like you feed the brain, you're feeding the gut, you feed the gut, right? You know, the, you're going to have good brain health. 
And I think a lot of physicians are already speaking that language, but I think it's going to be more powerful than, you know, where it's it, the, the dinner conversations are are today. So as far as that, the gut instinct, um, that can be complicated. You know, I, I tell people when I, I try to help people listen to their intuition, if you will, or their gut instinct, but I kind of liken that to the idea that we all have sort of an antenna. <laughs> and if our antenna is sort of broken or bent, we might get different signals. <laughs> and, and then comes the layer of perception, you know, and reality, I don't want to get too crazy into that. Oh, please. Uh, so, so, so gut instinct, somebody will say, well, why is my gut instinct? I, I know this, why didn't it come out this way? Or why, you know, maybe, maybe your antenna was a little bit bent. Maybe we need to look at this. Maybe we don't have all the information, right? So any kind of not good feeling in the gut, the way that I handle that again is through either using an energy tool to balance it, to resolve it, to get that in balance. So it's open to receiving information in the best way that it can. Let's talk about the primal brain mm -hmm. uh, a bit. I don't even think I have a brain, firstly. Uh, you do. Um, <laughs> you do. Uh, some people have accused me of not having a brain. I'm just <laughs> echoing. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned how energy psychology maybe may deal with that on some level. That may yeah. be at the root yeah. of the yeah. cause of some people's problems. Yeah, this this stems a lot from Stephen Porges's work in polyvagal theory, and a lot of people out there may have heard of that or may not. But again, super oversimplified. It has to do with the fight and flight mechanism in the brain, and then the freeze mechanism. And really, our primal brain—it's the back of our brain. It's a very old part of our brain. Was designed to really keep us safe in times of danger. And you know, the classic example is that you know to. To save us from the saber-toothed tigers, we had choices, right? Here comes the behavior choices. We could either run, we could either fight, or we could hide. And so there's the fight, flight, and freeze mechanisms. And so we had we had a choice on how to, to implement that. Um, and that really sent a whole bunch of different chemicals and physiological processes into motion for us to be able to engage in one of those activities in times of danger. The thing about that mechanism is it's not devised for consistent and prolonged use. And guess what society is kind of doing to us today? It's kind of pushing us into this. Burn it, it's burning it out. A lot of people, you know, we're, we're maintaining in, in those states more often than not. Now, if I just, again, segue a little bit to athletes and peak performers, athletes absolutely are trained to activate those mechanisms more often than not. They're run, If you think of any sport, right, they're running, they have to be able to stop and be agile somewhere on, on a dime. And there's some sort of fight and fight doesn't necessarily have to mean a punch or aggression, but it could be, you know, aggression as to this whole sports psychology thing, aggression as defined in, you know, getting the ball, you know, getting the puck. It doesn't necessarily mean I have to give you an elbow or, or punch you to get that, but I have to be, um, you know, a heightened assertive, to be able to to win or to achieve the goals goal oriented goal oriented so it's not surprising to me when i see professional athletes in the news who are either in trouble with the law or have had domestic disputes or there's there's fights or there's you know alcohol or substance abuse or use because their brains kind of don't know how to shut that off it wants to keep going. And this is the beauty of using these tools with athletes. These are prime examples, right? People are there at the top of their field. You know, why should I need therapy? I've never had an anxiety. I'm doing well. I make a lot of money. I'm, I'm great. But then you see these other places in their life, it sort of spills over a little bit. And I don't think a lot of people are putting it together that way. I think, you know, when we see something like that in media, we have a lot of judgment and think, oh, they're just, you know, getting in trouble because, you know, they're arrogant or they have money and they can do this. When to me, if, if I look at it from that primal brain standpoint, it makes perfect sense that that's something that's practiced, it's rehearsed, and they're staying activated all the time. So it's very difficult to come out of that. And a lot of my clients that come in, you know, again, with anxiety and what's been going on in the world, you know, there's a lot of stressors that, that are keeping people's, you know, anxiety. I always do this. I make this visual for those of you at home who can't see me. I have my hand like beside my ear, like a level. 
And it's kind of like my signal for a threshold of what, how much is too much anxiety, because it's a certain degree of anxiety it can be good. It can be helpful in a certain way in certain circumstances, but when it, when it kind of barrels over that threshold, it, it's sort of debilitating, and especially to those, those mechanisms, or it keeps us in those mechanisms for prolonged periods. And then what happens is people say, I'm burnt out, I'm exhausted, I'm feeling fatigue, I'm caffeinating, um, I'm using a lot of um, sleep aids, whether it's cannabis or what, and then I have to have can caffeine to get up in the morning. So their brain is really so fatigued that they're searching for, and again, substance abuse or use, like you have, if you look at it that way, is it really just because I have this addiction, which came first, the chicken or the egg, or has my brain been fatiguing and I need support? And I found that those things give me the support in the short run that I need. So there's a lot to our primal brain and polyvagal theory. I think it's getting a lot of attention. What, what, what is the polyvagal theory? It's Stephen Porges' idea. He talks about this, the fight flight, and then there's those thresholds. I don't want to get into it. Too thresholds. Much, but the, the thresholds of how much is too much and when that's activated and the chemical and endorphins in our central nervous system, when that is all activated to, the, to, to protect us versus when it's relaxed. Gotcha. You know, I, I sometimes talk about, you know, the differences or the difference between the, the brain, which is an extremely useful thing, uh, and the mind. And uh, uh, most people seem to have the conception, I would say misconception, is that the brain is in charge. And I tell them all the time, the brain is not in charge. The brain is in charge of your body. Your mind is in charge of your brain. Unless you don't know it, then the brain's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> if you your your our brain works off of patterns right we have all these patterns we have these beliefs starting from day one right uh, i'm just i'm 56 but there are so many so many of my operations and movements are coming from you know when i was came from when i was four years old you know and i still haven't broke through that pattern uh but and i can accept this about myself or or i can look at it, become aware of it, and decide to change something. Uh, and that's where the mind comes in, because if I just let my, my brain do its thing, I'm just going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until, because it's a habit. It's either yeah, so, so now we're back to behavior modification. So yeah. what you're talking about in clinical terms, in ABA terms, or applied behavior analysis, is you've learned a behavior, it's been reinforced, or it's served a purpose, mm. or whatever it's it's you know how to function and then you you utilize that or implement that behavior more and more and it becomes what people call a habit and the longer that you have and engage in that behavior the longer it maintains the harder it is to extinguish not impossible but it's a little bit difficult and then it depends about the function right there are four functions of any behavior that can be to get attention to get something tangible in hand to get away from something get out of something or to have some sort of sensory feedback, which is like internal gratification that doesn't necessarily affect others. Um, like using a substance, I hate to use that example, but you know, twiddling our thumbs, sort of gum chewing, those types of things. And so whatever purposes or function that behavior serves, it can be reinforced. Oftentimes when I work with, again, with, with ASD and autism spectrum disorder, a lot of um, those kiddos, the families are asking me to change some behaviors that are not adaptive. And oftentimes, if the parents can't extinguish them, they're what we call in behavioral language, the multifunction behaviors, which means that they have more than one of those functions at one time. So they're com quite complex and layered. So yes, this is why behaviorism, just with this example that you gave me, is so important in my daily practice. And I say to my energy psychology colleagues who kind of think ABA is a little bit sterile, I say, what do you think you're doing when you're doing energy psychology with people? Eventually you're changing a behavior, whether it's reducing a fear to be able to move forward in a more comfortable way or to go back out and do that new experience or to be able to drive again without feeling anxious or to get into that social situation or to get back up in that airplane. It's, it ultimately changes a behavior. So the two definitely go hand in hand. Great stuff. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back with Mandy Fridger. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. What are the secrets to wealth? Benjamin Franklin taught them, but people are ignorant or just forget. What if you make sure neither afflicts you? Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O. 
www.wealthmindset.io where you can actually become certain you are on your way to wealth. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. I'm here with Mandy Fritcher. We're having a wonderful conversation, vivacious. We're going in different directions, multifaceted. I'm loving it. I'm really thrilled with this discussion. Thank you so much again for being here, Mandy. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to let out a secret. I hope she doesn't get angry with me. She, you know, her la- she's not really German. Uh, <laughs> you look at this last name, Frigid. She's Italian, like me. She's a Guinea, <laughs> like me. Except I'm a quarter Irish. She's a quarter Greek. I think, right. she's, got me, I think she's got me beat with that quarter stuff. Part. There's some debate about the French, but, you know. We'll just go oh, okay. That. All right. Very That's good. Right you know, I, did, I did the DNA test a couple of years ago, and it was surprising. It's like, no, Tony, you actually have like a quarter mainland Italian in you. You got you got Greek, you got Spanish with Spain now. You're over here. I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting when you look into the genetic true background as opposed to, you know, the, the, the uh, lineage that you heard you have. It's very fascinating. Let's get into peak performance, okay? We, we, I mean, we've alluded to it. We've, we've come up on it. And you, you work both... Uh, ABA and energy psychology for using peak performance. What, what kind of approach approach you use? You told you said how a lot a lot of these athletes are you know in these this mm-hmm. these uh, enhanced peaks so, uh, or or state so much that they frazzle out and burn out. Yeah. Uh, but what some of you describe your approach or basically yeah. speaking? Well, I I commonly see a few different presentations when athletes um, come into treatment. One of the big ones is post injury and afraid of re-injury, first injury, you know, I'm, I'm checking out, got an A plus, but afraid I'm going to do it again. Um, concussions with that too. I spent a lot of my early training with Dr. Nicosia. He treated a lot of um, head injuries and accidents and cases like that. So I had a lot of experience with cognitive rehabilitation too, as well as the energy work. So a lot of athletes who are post-concussive, even my clients, um, who are not necessarily athletes who have concussions. It's really interesting. The medical community um, discharges them from a lot of the traditional treatments. And what I hear from people, I have been for years, is that they, their head just still doesn't feel right. So physically, it might check out. There's no evidence of a brain bleed. They've gone through the respective physical therapies, but cognitively, they still don't feel up to par. I say, you know, it's like you're discharged and then, uh, you know, an A minus, but people need to be back up to their A plus kind of thing. And <clears throat> the secondary effects of those cognitive effects can be a lot of different feelings, whether it's anxiety, whether it's anger, whether it's depression and sadness, because I can't do what I did before. So I see a lot of that with um, athletes and non-athletes too, with head strikes. Another issue that I tend to see with athletes is stress about extraneous things um, that may not be related to the sport, but might be affecting the sport. So I can't kind of keep home life separate from this. There's something that's going on that's too much here, Um, maybe something with a teammate, and I just can't separate it. An interesting thing about sports psychology is I, I think that we are really missing the boat with where psychoeducation happens for young athletes and what kind of coping skills and strategies we're giving them. I I still think that we're, for the most part, of course, this doesn't, I'm not speaking for everybody everywhere, but for the most part, we're raising athletes and coaches are raising them with just a lot of positive and reinforcement and encouragement. And, you know, you're good, you have high repetition, again, behavior modification, you're gonna come a long way. And if I can just speak with the female athletes a little bit, you know, there's a lot of changes that happen, of course, with girls. And I still think that they're getting coached the same way that we coach males. And I, I just wanna be clear here that gender, whatever someone identifies as their gender is their gender, but I'm just speaking boys and girls and how the teams are just generally structured today still in high schools, right? So I think we're missing the boat with a lot of the social stressors that come into play for both boys and girls, but I think that they're different. I think girls, you know, there's a lot of um, challenges with with peers, 
We have a lot of hormonal changes going on, what's going on in the rest of their lives, parental stress, parental, um, you know, maybe perhaps demands about their athletic performance and, you know, them hovering boys, you know, same kinds of things, but in, but a little bit different. And so girls and boys, you know, the way that they handle their emotions sometimes are different. And that really has to do, I think, with their upbringing, with culture. And so that's why it's important too. We, you know, we have a lot of talk about diversity in the past few years, but it's really important when I have a new person come in to me for therapy, whether they're an athlete or not, that I know who they are and what their mindset is, how they were raised, what they believe to be true, and what are their core beliefs? Because I can't impose that for, for anybody without asking. So those are a lot of the different things that athletes um, will come in to, to see me with. Another issue that they Hold will- Hold on a second, Mandy. <laughs> you said you can't impose a belief. What did you mean by that? Say that again? You can't impose your belief. Is that, did I understand? Yeah, I mean, I can't make a judgment as a therapist. I mean, this is kind of therapy 101, okay, but I okay. still think that we're human and we kind of get lost in that sometimes that right. we can't assume, make an assumption about what somebody, how they were raised, or maybe, you know, they, they live in a certain area. Maybe they look a certain way. Maybe they're a certain athletic status and academic. Can't really make an assumption about what their beliefs are um, until I really ask them. Another thing that I experience with athletes is they're, they're like the top athlete for a really long time. <laughs> and then they hit the college where it's like super competitive and it's just like, I'm not the best anymore. You know, I see this with academics too, right? You have a valedictorian and then they go to college and everybody's, you know, on the equal playing field, no pun intended. And so that's a layer of stress, feeling, you know, not, not good enough. And I haven't experienced failure really or loss. And how do I deal with that? So those are some of the things that I, um, I experienced with athletes and the energy psychology, again, with some of the behavior training and sometimes depending on the age, some of the high direction. Like, for example, I don't know, I, I see a trend in my practice when I see younger people, younger kids in general, teens, early 20s, that there's definitely a difference in life skills functioning than, than there was 20 Meaning, you know, the independence level across the board, being able to, you know, fill out college loans on their own, being able to take the initiative, say, hey, I have to email a professor or, you know, say that I'm accountable, hold personal accountability. It's really shifting. And again, that's not everybody, but to me, the trend is it's shifting downward. And so those types of things sometimes need a little bit more of, of high direction and like, this is kind of the world and this is what's going to happen. Everything is not warm and fuzzy. You're not going to have a hug. <laughs> from every professor <laughs> and you know really you, you shouldn't expect that either so some of my younger athletes um things like that um, as well as my clients who aren't athletes but again back to athletes and peak performance usually they come in with a presenting issue and it could be just a, one skill that slips usually because of injury I'll, I'll use that for an example we work on the injury and then the next step of that or the or the block the cognitive block around the fear or the hesitation because I'm, I can't fully execute or fully run or whatever because I'm afraid of re-injury and then after we work through that I try to take it to the next level with all the traditional strategies, visualization, relaxation, and I use my energy tools to take them to the next level so that they're at their best performance and then they're optimal. And what I do in my sessions, even with my non-athletes, is I really like to give people homework. And so they, they have these tools at their own disposal, but we figure out which tools work for them and when to use them so that they can be lifelong tools that people have. And so often, you know, my, my clients will say, oh, I was doing really well for a while, so I didn't use the tools anymore. And I always say, like stretching before you run a race, you know, you should make them part of your daily practice, whatever they are. So I think even the best of us are guilty at, hey, I'm feeling great, so I don't need to engage in my self-care for a little bit because I have other things on my plate. So you really give your, your clients an education. I mean, obviously, you, you have your intervention, your approach. Uh, you know, and then you have your, your outcome, say, uh, and then you, you also give them, you know, a toolbox or mm -hmm. they say, listen, these, you, this is a, there's a maintenance here. All right. <laughs> right. And then of course, like always, you know, you can have the greatest toolbox in, in the world. You don't take those tools out and do something with them, especially use them correctly. Yeah. You know, 
back, back to Mandy's uh, office, back on the couch. <laughs> you know, no, and that's that's not the long term goal, but inevitably, you know, that happens with with peak performers, and we find and and even the people we find our zone, we find our tools that work for us, and then lo and behold, something else happens, sort of out of our schema, kind of like your example right? You're a high performer and all of a sudden this kind of came out of nowhere. What happens? And then it's even more startling because you feel like you do have tools, but the tools maybe don't work. And so that just, that really says to the brain, wait a minute, I'm really not safe. If I have all these things at my disposal and something isn't working. So we're just, we're human is how I'm going to speak for yourself, Mandy. And it just, it, it, we wax and wane in our moods and our strategies. We're always, you know, working with our own physiology as well as, you know, all the moving parts of the environment. Absolutely. Great stuff. We're going to take our final break uh, to hear from our sponsor, and then we'll come back with the unfortunate last segment with Manny Frigia, and we'll be right back. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. Perficio learns more about you as you make progress and then uses that information to help you even more. It is quasi-AI. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can be helped by something that learns more about you because that is the difference that makes the difference. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. And we're with Mandy Frigia, and we're having a fantastic conversation. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end. Uh, maybe I can, you know, milk it a little bit like, but we'll keep it fresh and organic as it has been. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I really am very appreciative of it. Let's get into autism, you know, which is a big part of what you do. I don't know to what percentage, but I know you have a new book coming out. I know you work with ASD. Uh, and I know you're, you have a, I know one of the things that before uh, I met you here in, the, in this interview is I know you, you also there are different types of caregiver that you yeah. are. Is that correct that you are? You identify that? And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let me just give you an overview. My history with autism is I, I didn't really expect to treat autism. <laughs> autism spectrum disorder is what the formal um, diagnosis is according to DSM-5 now. And I kind of fell into this and um, I thought, wow, this is just way out of my expertise. This is so complicated. And I I was just in a position where I, you know, my there was an overwhelming need at the time, and my supervisor said, "Okay, you have to learn this." So I did. I got pretty good at it, I, I might add, and I, I went on to from direct treatment to a lot of supervision, work with caregivers, and I actually ran a private school. It was um, a Cleveland Clinic affiliate school. We were the first affiliate program, so I'm licensed uh, for private schools as a principal and a social emotional um, teach special education teacher. So it was at the school that I had a lot of direct contact day in and day out, hours at a time, you know, prolonged exposure to really be submerged in the culture of this disorder. And, um, you know, we were, we were an ABA program at the time and I'd always used ABA with the kids. And I realized that, hey, you know, this, the parents, the caregivers are, have a very different need because they have very different demands than other types of caregivers. All caregivers have stress, you know, those for the elderly or, or other people that are, uh, have, have different types of needs. But this particular subpopulation is, was very um, misunderstood, I think, not heard appropriately and sadly enough by their own family members, right? Why can't you just fill in the blank? Why can't the kid just fill in the blank? You need to just fill in the blank. So it kind of the light bulb happened and I thought, well, you know, maybe I should be spreading the word about how energy psychology can help with caregivers because they're fast tools. They're relatively fast. You know, parents with, with young kids diagnosed don't have time to take an hour walk every day because, you know, there's a lot of issues with that babysitting, if kids unsafe, all that kind of stuff, um, or to go have lunch with friends or just to have some wine. You know, it's, they're, they're not really realistic solutions to meditate an hour a day. So, so I did a lot of research about what other caregiver suggestions were, and those were what I was finding. So I thought, let me sort of pack this material that I've been teaching for a long time at that point and put it out there for caregivers. And in the book, I talk about the different parts that go into caregivers' strength or resilience. And I, I looked at um, uh, Kenneth Blanchard's model, Hershey and Blanchard's, right? And, and they look at skill and will 
And these, for those of you who don't know, really are were harnessed in the business world and looking at leadership development a lot. But if we think about a parent who has a child diagnosed, you know, their skill set should be good. And I am a strong advocate of ABA. You know, people think it's harsh. People think it's bold. But I'm, I'm on the conservative end. I think, you know, kids need to be able to function in the world given what the world brings to them. You know, I love I just, harsh. <laughs> say that again? I love harsh. <laughs> well, well, it's, I'm being, I'm being, I'm being, I'm, playful. I mean, it's I'm being playful, but I actually, I, you know, I am, I have no children, but I'm the kind of guy, and this comes from, from my childhood that throws, the, a kid needs to learn how to swim, throw him in the pool. If he has, if he's not swimming, throw him in the pool. If he starts drowning, I jump in, but let that kid's got to learn how to swim and he's going to, and he's going to learn it one way or another. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say this and you brought up our cultures. I mean, my family culture was, was like that too. And I, I do think that part of that is cultural, but, you know, being um, children of immigrants, I assume your parents were, were immigrants, right? My mother was born in Italy, but my father. My mother, so, so this was survival, right? This is do or die, sink or swim. So that type of parenting really came from an organic survival mode. It wasn't meant to be mean. It, it no. was it was meant to, so, so I think we've, we've kind of moved away from, like, I, I can say my generation, I think, you know, when I was growing up, we were all like, oh, we're not going to be mean like our parents and we're going to do, be nice. And, and really what it's, it's, I think it's created, um, you know, risk for the kids because it one, like I said earlier, it's difficult to accept failure. You know, they, they didn't learn a lot of coping skills for those kids who were raised like that. And quite frankly, I'm seeing a lot of the 20 somethings in therapy because they don't have any tools because everything went their way. So when we talk about the skill, though, for the caregivers, I really emphasize ABA. I mean, this is tried and true for kids with this disorder. Yes, there's poor ABA. Yes, there's better ABA. There so therapists. parents can learn. Parents can learn this ABA. Parents can learn this, and that gives them a good skill set. When you have a good skill set, and when you know what you're doing, you become more confident, right? And then there's the willingness to want to help your child, which, of course, we we think everyone has the willingness, but the reality is, is this gets exhausting with this population. And it's okay when parents say, can say in a safe space, I'm tired and I, and I just don't think I can do this anymore. And that's, again, the elephant in the room that I encourage parents to be honest, especially in sessions, to say, okay, well, we can work with that. We just need to really know how you feel about it. And then those two, the skill and the will piece really affect this, this bigger energetic piece, which I you know call the biofield. And the biofield, we're just getting new research about it and learning more and more about it. And it's very complex. It's our energy field that sort of makes up, you know, our body and it's, it's influenced by the things within our body. It's influenced by thoughts, it's influenced by things outside of us. So again, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of, you know, work in progress and it's constantly evolving and changing. But when someone's really exhausted and that field is weak, you know, it, it kind of affects the skill and the will. If I'm too tired and not willing to do something, right? My thoughts probably start to backslide. I probably start to feel more negative and I, then I might question my skills and then my energy level is just depleted and I'm not effective. So in the book, I talk about how these three things influence different caregiver types. I'm not going to go through all the types now because I, I don't know if we have time, but you definitely can fit a pattern and identify with, hey, I, I'm, I'm a person, I have not so much skill, but I have a lot of willingness and I think I'm pretty confident and my field is strong, but not sure. And so I have a chart in the book that goes through all of those. So, excuse me a second. So a person can sort of fit themselves in one profile or another and yeah. then see what the better approach yeah. is. Okay. Absolutely. And so in the book, I talk a lot about how to develop the skill, where to get the skill set, how to, how to consult with professionals. If you know nothing about how to implement any type of behavior modification with your child. I talk about that. The willingness is sort of a therapeutic piece, right? That a person might have to explore a little bit on their own. But the biofield piece also can be helped with a lot of the energy psychology tools. So I have some suggestions in the book too. So the types are there, your type can change um, it, throughout time, depending on what's going on. But as long as you're sort of mindful of your type and know, oh, I'm probably need a little bit more of this right now, right? Need a little bit more of that. I think it puts it in perspective for the parent in a very short amount of time so that they can reduce their um, trajectory toward burnout. What is the name of the book and when's it coming out? Yeah, from Exhausted to Energize, the Autism Spectrum Disorder Caregiver's Guide. Um, we are on the last round of edits, so very soon. <laughs> so, 
So <laughs> imminently, long, can, work in progress. <laughs> can we say imminently? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, uh, from exhausted to what? Energized. Energized. That was very good. Okay, so very good. And I'll definitely help you promote, promote it when it comes out. Uh, yeah, this has been a wonderful and really, I quite frankly, an extraordinary conversation. I, I usually, you know, certainly I, I, I've interviewed therapists before. But you went into a level of granularity that was always interesting and never, never can, oh, no, not never too confusing. Okay, <laughs> all right. But but it's like okay, well, there's some you know there's some depth to it, uh, yeah. but not too deep where where people like you know where my eyes glossed over. Uh, so and it was it was so multifaceted and rounded. It was really such a fantastic discussion we've had. Thank I really, you. Very really, enjoyable. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And uh, do you have any final remarks for the audience, Mandy? I would just suggest anybody out there who's thinking about um, therapy or maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't shop around for a therapist. I know a lot of people are full. I mean, there's a lot going on in the world and sometimes it's hard to get in, but not everybody is a match. Not everybody's style is for everybody. And our licensure laws, uh, as far as counseling, the you know, across the states are really opening up a lot of states to be able to seek counseling services outside of your state. Um, typically, you stay within your state for insurance purposes or who you work with, but you know, check your state and um, yeah, seek it out. See, see, uh, see how it helps you. And again, find a right match. Now you're over in Pittsburgh. Uh, you you deal with clients both in person and on dig, in digitally. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, be, before COVID and we, the lockdown, I was probably about half and half where I was doing virtual sessions anyway. And where my, where my office is in Pittsburgh, it's like right in the middle of the city, so it's like prime rush hour time. And so people were like, "Yeah, I think it's just easier if I if I do it virtually." So it's no difference to me. I, some therapists might have a preference. Some people say, oh, you know, I feel better when I see somebody in person. It's it's no different to me. I can use all the tools I have in person across the web. Very cool. What's your website and how can people contact you? Yeah, it's my name, www.mandyfridger.com. M-A-N-D-I-F-R-E-G-E-R.com. You're saying it too quickly. F-R-E-G-E-R. This way it is. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's Mandy Fridger, spelled that way. Spelled yep. Fridger dot com and any email address or just go to the website yeah there's a contact on there some of the research is on there other podcasts are on there information about me so if you have any interest um i talk a lot of, we didn't talk much about executive functioning today but i do have a lot of short youtube videos about that when we talk about the brain and thoughts and how that influences us you know too. What we can, you know what uh we can do uh what, what my 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 social media team has been doing now we've been doing some social media lives if you'd like uh -huh. we can do a live on like instagram and talk about executive function oh great yeah like something about sure. but, uh, uh great stuff uh and what about social are you uh, do you have any social media uh accounts i have a youtube channel i haven't posted um things in a while but the things that i have are, are still pretty relevant so it's it's my name amanda it's the only thing branded as amanda fridger um my facebook and linkedin Great. So we'll, we'll have a profile set up for you at the website with all that info. This is thanks again. This has been a great, great discussion. Oh, thank you. A pleasure to finally meet you. We, we've had a few, you know, a few exchanges on Facebook uh, and this it's really been my, my pleasure and delight. Thanks again. And um, remember everyone, we're all responsible for ourselves and we could all use a little help. And with that, thanks for listening. Tony out. Thanks again, Mandy. Great stuff. Thank you for tuning in to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. Remember to visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast.